All right, let's start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day, for your many blessings, for the love that you have given us, the mercy and the grace. We ask you now to give us grace to learn more of you and to put our faith our trust, our confidence in you and your holy words. These things we pray through your name, you who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God unto the ages of ages. Amen. 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 Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So give me just one second here. Okay, that was Matushka, and she just was confirming the, the video and the recording and everything. All right, so today we are supposed to talk about theosis. Theosis, in the Orthodox view, is the be-all and end-all of everything. It is our reason for being. It is why we become Christians. And it's a bit disconcerting that in most churches you don't even hear this word theosis. You don't hear it in the Protestant churches. You don't hear it really in the Roman church. But theosis is why we are here. We are... Jesus teaches us to call God Abba, to call God Daddy. It's not just Father, but I mean, this is a child's word for his father or her father. Daddy is what we would translate it into English, Abba. And this use of this very, very intimate word that Jesus teaches us to use shows that we need to have this strong, intimate, childlike relationship with our Father in heaven. That is our, that is our goal. Jesus reveals to us the nature of this relationship through many different means. But one of the primary means by which Christ reveals our relationship with Abba Father is through the incarnation, through his very being as a man. Because in the incarnation, we see that God, who is fully divine, has come and taken to himself a human body, a human form, a human will, a human intellect, a human soul, and has united the divinity with the mortal in the person of Jesus Christ. And the way that this reveals to us what God's plan is, is that it shows us that he desires to unite himself, his divinity with our humanity. So, when scripture says that Christ is the first fruits, we see that there are, will be other fruit of the same type, divine united with human. That is, that is the fruit. He is the first fruit. And he is the first fruit from the dead. We will be fruits 
from these bodies which will one day die, but will be resurrected into a new life in heaven. Now, the concept here is not that we are just going to go to this new city, the new Jerusalem, this new place where the streets are paved with gold. This, this, is, this is only part of the concept here. The true concept of theosis is that we will share in God's divinity that we will be united with Abba Father in such a way that we will become gods by grace. And this is most miraculous. This is most extraordinary that a human, someone who is flesh and bone, someone who is subject to uh, disease, um, our, our bodies are weak, we, we get broken bones, we get bruises, we cut ourselves. It, we're, not, we're not gods. And we understand this. So to then stretch our minds to understand that one day, we will be as gods through our union with the Father. It is indeed a leap in our understanding and in our faith. So that any teaching that distracts us from this goal is not a proper teaching. We've heard probably many times the reason that we're here is to love and to serve God in this life and to be with him forever in the life to come. And this is something of the, um, of the Western catechism that has persisted for many years. But if you think about our relationship to God as a relationship of a young child to his or her parents. And we look at that relationship. Well, what parent says, you know, I'm only going to accept you if you, if you serve me. You have to serve me. You have to do this, that, or the other to please me. Some parents do, but that's not the true nature of the relationship between the parent and the child. The true nature of that relationship should be one of love. And I would venture to say that most adults do not place that type of burden on their young children. Yes, there may be chores, Yes, they may have to share in the household work, but their reason for being is not service to the parents. And there's a difference. There's a difference between chores, helping out around the house, participating in the activities of the household, and having one's reason for being be that service. And I believe that if we understand this, if we understand that my parents didn't have me because they wanted a servant. My parents had me because they loved me. They wanted me. And we extrapolate that to God. And if Jesus is telling us to call God daddy, that God wants something more 
than just our service. Yes, he's, he's very pleased. He loves it when we do things to, to spread the word, to take the gospel of Christ into the nations, to bring our brothers and sisters to the Lord, to open for them the gates of salvation through Christ. Oh, he loves that. And he welcomes that. But our reason for being is because God loves us. Our reason for being is because he made us in his image and likeness. Our reason for being is to ultimately be united with him forever. And through this union, to become God's by grace. St. Augustine said, God became men so that men might become God. And that sums it up, that our total reason for being here is to experience this great union with our Lord to be one with him. And certainly we look to the weak and to the helpless to understand this fully. Because if we look to, let's say one who is mentally feeble, one who's unable in any stretch of the imagination to comprehend the theological truths of the gospel, much less to preach that gospel to other people, is that person, because of his or her incapacity, less loved by our Father? No, absolutely not. So, we can see that his love is not conditioned upon our service. Rather, his love is unconditional. It surrounds us, it envelops us at all moments. It is his desire that all should come to know him and to know his love. Because in knowing his love and in experiencing his love, we begin like mirrors to reflect that love and to let that love pour out to those around us, to our neighbors, to those we encounter, to our family. It is his love which our lives should mirror because we do exist in his image and likeness. Does that mean we who are capable don't work in the fields of the harvest? No, absolutely not. If we are capable, we go out. The love that we've received pushes us forward. <laughs> in service, but it's a service born out of gratitude. It's a service born out of love. It's a service born out of thanksgiving. It is a Eucharistic service, a service that is born out of fear, a service that is born out of trying to buy our way into heaven. This is not what the Lord wants. The Lord wants the service that flows cheerfully from a heart that realizes the magnitude of what Christ has done to bring us from death and sin to life in him, to give us 
a restoration of the true nature of the human being, the image and likeness of God and its fullness, and to react to that great gift of salvation and redemption through Christ with our whole heart, serving God out of gratitude. That, that is what we should strive for. So our purpose then is this, that we are journeying towards theosis, union with God. And this union is not something that we have to wait for heaven for. The kingdom of God is here. It is within each of us. Our union with God starts now, in this moment, in this time. We don't have to wait. We can call our Father in heaven, Abba. We can humble ourselves as children before him. This fosters that union. To also humble our thoughts and our minds. Sometimes we have great, wonderful thoughts. And yet, it is the simple self denial of coming before him as a child, acknowledging his greatness and simply saying, Abba, Father, will we find ourselves empowered. When we exalt our own thoughts and our own understanding of the way things are, we lose sight of that childlike posture. But when we humble ourselves and become as children, that's when we find a true union, a true connection to God the Father. And that's the path to theosis, this humble spirit, this contrite heart, this self-denial, denial for all of our own thoughts, putting them aside, and letting God reign within our hearts. If we go back to the analogy of the, of the one who suffers under mental disability, incapable of understanding theological precepts, incapable of preaching the gospel, and we look at that, and we realize that if that is, let's say, point A, and we look at where we are and our ability to understand and comprehend, and that's point B. And if we can measure the distance between point A and point B, and we could, we could say that measure is one inch. That all that we know, all that we learn, that advances us intellectually. And then we look at the difference between where we are, 
point B, and where God is, point C, we measure that distance, B to C, we're talking light years, such that from God's perspective, from Abba's perspective, that one who is mentally challenged and cannot comprehend theological precepts as we can, and we who can understand them, we're so, we're so very close in God's eyes, as if we are at the same spot. A and B are almost identical in God's eyes. It's only when we come to that realization that we're able to understand how humble we really should be. And to realize also that this concept of what well, we have to serve God does he need our service? Did he need us when he created the world? Did he need us? No. He doesn't need our service. Yes, it's, it, it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. We should. Our, our hearts, our, our, our expression of love for the Father should be such that we want to serve him. We want to go out and spread the good news of what he's done and how he's he reclaimed us from death. But does he need us? No, he doesn't. Our purpose is that we are made in his image and likeness. Our purpose is that we are his loved we are his beloved. We are his children. Christ said, suffer the little children come unto me because such is the kingdom of heaven. How many of us truly understand that our purpose is to be loved by God the Father? What does that mean? We see also Jesus when he, when he talks to Martha. Martha says, Lord, tell my sister to help me. She's just sitting there doing nothing. What does our Lord say? He says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many, many things. There's only one thing necessary. Mary has chosen the better part, and it won't be denied her. We have to put into perspective that that better part is just taking in this massive amount of love that the Father, that Daddy, bestows on us. And in this love, becoming able within our own lives to reflect that love, reflecting God's love back to him because we've learned how to love truly and unconditionally from him. We can't, we can't develop our own type of love. That's not going to work. Our love has to be the same love that God gives us. We have to learn how to love from him. How can we learn to love from him except by being united with him? Receiving his love, basking in his love. If you've ever gone to the pool... And after a brief swim in the cool water, 
you lie on the side of the pool there on a maybe a beach towel or a lounge chair or something and you feel the warming rays of the sun touch you basking in god's love can be compared to that experience where you just feel the warmth of the sun on every part of your body god's love penetrates us it enters in it warms us it gives us strength it gives us purpose and it gives us our identity our identity this is who we are we are children of god that is our value our value is not that we are accountants or doctors or whatever it is that we are our value is that we are children of god the world misses this the world takes its value from the material possessions that one has the world sees value in the profession that one has one sees value in the connections and the network that one has the world sees value in how many people follow you on social media this is not our value our value is that we are children of god and that we are loved by him and our call is to receive his love because in receiving his love we learn how to love others in return this is our purpose theosis is the end result of this great exchange of love between the child and the father as they become united as one just as christ was united with his human body and became one in hypostatic union divine and man all at the same time so we too become gods and humans all at one time being united to our father in heaven i'll say it one last time yes service is a product of that love that once we experience this love we're animated by that love and we want to go and serve god we have this desire to please him we have this great fire in the belly that sends us forth but our true purpose is to be loved our true purpose is to seek theosis as we have discussed over these past 7 weeks there are many theological truths that help us to uncover the mystery of the christian faith the mystery of christ's incarnation his life his death and his resurrection but there's no greater lesson than the lesson christ teaches and his words this is eternal life to know 
the Father. And in those words, we understand to know as being the same verb that we see in Genesis where Adam knew Eve, that his knowledge of Eve was so intimate, the knowledge of a husband and wife, that this knowing God must be that intimate. We must become one. We must unite ourselves to Abba. And we see this fully reflected in the revelation of St. John, where he says, we await the wedding feast of the Lamb. This marriage between God and mankind. In the marriage ceremony that was most prevalent in Galilee where Christ grew up, it was common for the betrothal to happen. And during the betrothal, the bridegroom would give to the bride a chalice of wine. And if she drank of the chalice, she committed herself to the betrothal. If she rejected and gave the chalice back, there was no betrothal. But once the bride had sipped of the chalice, given it back to the bridegroom, the bridegroom would then drink from the chalice and he would say, I will not drink again of this chalice until I drink it with you in my father's house. Do those words sound familiar? They should, because those were our Lord's words as well. And then the two would be separated. The bride would go to her father's house and she would begin preparing. She would make a bridal dress and begin preparing to leave her father's house to go live with the bridegroom. And the bridegroom would go to his father's house and there he would begin construction of a new kind of a suite off of his father's house, a, a, a chamber, a little home attached to his father's home for he and his bride. And he would work on this building it, building the furniture, building the, the structure. And on the night determined by the father, by the bridegroom's father he would say it is time and they would begin processing through the streets of the village everyone would be awakened by the noise and the clamoring and they would go to fetch the bride often in the middle of the night and that's when the wedding would occur no one knew the only person who knew was the father of the bridegroom. This marriage is taking place. The betrothal have ha has happened. We have sipped from the chalice. He is preparing a place for us and he will come and take us to that great wedding feast. Let us be prepared. This is the union between God and man. This is our goal.
if you are listening to this broadcast today and you would like more information, encourage you to reach out to, to me, Father Robert, or to one of the priests or brothers in the Celtic Orthodox Church so that we can talk to you about giving your life to our Lord Jesus Christ. And at this time, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, I will take questions from those who are here today, and I will um, paraphrase those questions back to um, the recording for the, for the audience later. Our first uh, question is about asceticism. And basically the question centers around the fact that what has been presented as us seeking to be children of God and to allow God to work in our lives, how does that um, uh, coincide with the call to asceticism, the call to actually labor uh, for this um, spiritual good that we seek. And I think here we have to realize that God um, was able to work through the thief on the cross, that even though he had not completed these spiritual exercises, that even though he had not become a great aesthetic, that Christ's love, his, his energy worked through this dying man to bring him to repentance, to, to bring a reflection of God's love to life in him as he hung from the cross. And because of this, he was promised paradise. And so we look at our lives and we say, well, you know, we, we try, we do our best, but we will not all succeed in perfect asceticism. But we must continue to make an effort. We must try. Sometimes we will desire, we will desire to go and pray. We will say, okay, it is, it's morning. I need to pray matins and we'll go and do that. Or it is evening. I'm getting ready to go to bed. I need to say my prayers. There'll be other times when we resist, when we, we're, we are, when we're tired, when we're fatigued, when when other things in life have weighed down upon us, we, we, and we don't have that desire. It doesn't mean we're bad people. It doesn't mean we're not living holy lives. It just means that we're human. But the difference, I think, is that the closer we come to God, the more our asceticism becomes an emanation of God's love for us that we've already experienced. It becomes less of a discipline and more of a response. So we have to be careful not to get the cart in front of the horse. That we look and we say, well, I can never do this. I could never do that. I don't have, I, I, I can't be like these monks. I, I, and, and we stop and we stop making an effort. Rather, I think what we need to do is to say, I first recognize God's love working within my life. And as his love works, I am compelled I am I'm energized, I desire, I want to do these aesthetical things. 
I'm able to fast. I'm able to, it becomes less of a work on our part and more of a response, a love response to what Christ has done for us. Scripture says, unless the master builds the house in vain, do the laborers labor. So we have to realize that within us, the same principle holds true. That our response to God has to be born from this great love that we've experienced. Not completed in fear, not completed in some desire to buy our salvation, but as a response. Our asceticism is in some respects a labor, but it's a labor of love. It's a labor of giving. It's a labor of reflecting God within our own lives and giving back to him the love that we have received from him. If you think about the person who is incapable of understanding theological precepts, and you think about the person who is, and you see that distance from A to B, we have to realize that God's perspective doesn't see that there's much difference at all. Our abilities are not all the same. We're not all called to be hermits. We're not all called to an aesthetical life in the sense of spending all day in meditation. Most of us have jobs, and families, chores. And then we look further and we say, well, if A to B, it's not really that big of a difference in God's eyes. We have to look at the, at the thief on the cross and, you know, if it's that, that's a negative where he was before he met Christ. And even yet, the distance between the thief on the cross and where we are, the difference is minuscule in God's eyes because he's so far above us. So we must not be discouraged. Yes, there are aesthetic practices that help us draw closer to him. But those aesthetic practices must be born out of our love for him, out of a response to his love for us. Our second question concerns a difficulty in embracing this thought that we are destined to become gods by grace. And so this question is coming from one of the Protestant catechumens, and she's voicing some concern here that how can we be gods? This is a difficult concept. And in response, there is an understanding that this is something quite amazing, quite supernatural, quite unlike any other religion, that a mere mortal could hold the hope of becoming like God. And yet this is precisely what the scriptures tell us, that within scriptures is hidden this great message that we are to have eternal life, we are to become immortal because of our union with God that God 
will share his immortality with us. And that this union can be likened to a marriage such that St. John talks about the marriage feast of the Lamb, God's union with mankind. We see it reflected in the Roman liturgy. We see it reflected in the Orthodox liturgy. In the Roman liturgy, we see the words pertaining to the preparation of the gifts that um, the priest or deacon will pray by the mixture of this water and wine. May we come to share in your divinity as you humbled yourself to share in our humanity. And we see this reflected in those words. We see also in preparing the gifts, the, the, the priest um, prays something along the lines of um, in order that in the, the flesh assumed by your incarnation, by the operation of divine power, he should make friends from servants, sons from the unrighteous, gods from men, eternal beings from mortals. So we have these same words almost, um, gods from men being prayed within the context of the Celtic Orthodox liturgy. So this concept of men becoming God um, can be seen in the context of God becoming man. We have to look to Christ as the prototype showing us that it is possible such that we can perceive that if Christ is living within us, if the Holy Spirit is within us, that we're already becoming united to God, that we are being transformed to be like God. Now we can't be God, no one can be God. God is uncreated, we are created. We can never change that. by God's union with us, we become like him. That concludes uh, the questions for today. I would like to invite anyone that has questions about the Orthodox faith about the Celtic Orthodox Church or about the Western communion of Orthodox churches to contact me, Father Robert. We will also be beginning a four week study on a comparison between the Orthodox faith and the heterodox faiths and that will be a four week study that begins in September, 2021. And you can join us for those discussions or um, they should be also posted on YouTube. It's been my pleasure to, to facilitate these discussion groups. I hope that you have been blessed through them. And again, if you have questions or would like to pursue the Orthodox faith, please contact me. I will close now with um, a prayer. Almighty God and Father, you are the source of our lives, the source of our being. You are the source of all love. I ask your blessings now on each of my brothers and sisters those who listen to these recordings, may your spirit touch them 
May their hearts be opened. May their eyes be opened. And may they respond to your call to join you in this great feast of love which emanates from your most holy presence. And bring forth a renewal of your word on the face of this earth, O Lord, and instill within each of us a sense of belonging as your children. We ask these things through Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. One God, unto the ages of ages. Amen.